Chapter One of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melanie Schleter McHelmont, Madison, Wisconsin, on the web at melanie.mchelmont.org. Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King Chapter 1. The Range The western margin of this continent is built of a succession of mountain chains folded in broad corrugations like waves of stone upon whose seaward base beat the mild small breakers of the Pacific. By far the grandest of these ranges is the Sierra Nevada, a long and massive uplift lying between the arid deserts of the Great Basin and the Californian exuberance of grain field and orchard. Its eastern slope, a defiant wall of rock plunging abruptly down to the plain. The western, a long, grand sweep, well watered and overgrown with cool, stately forests. Its crest, a line of sharp, snowy peaks, springing into the sky and catching the alpine glow long after the sun is set for all the rest of america the sierras have a structure and a physical character which are individual and unique to professor whitney in his corps of the geological survey of california is due the honor of first gaining a scientific knowledge of the form plan and physical conditions of the sierras how many thousands of miles, how many toilsome climbs we made, and what measure of patience came to be expended cannot be told. But the general harvest is gathered in, and already a volume of great interest, the forerunner of others, has been published. The ancient history of the Sierras goes back to a period when the Atlantic and Pacific were one ocean, in whose depths great accumulations of sand and powdered stone were gathering and being spread out in level strata. It's not easy to assign the age in which these submarine strata were begun, nor exactly the boundaries of the embryo continents from whose shores the primeval breakers ground away sand and gravel enough to form such incredibly thick deposits. It appears most likely that the Sierra region was submerged from the earliest Paleozoic, or perhaps even the Azoic age. Slowly, the deep ocean valley filled up until in the late Triassic period, the uppermost tables were in water shallow enough to drift the sands and clays into wave and ripple ridges. With what immeasurable patience, what infinite deliberation, has nature amassed the materials for these mountains? Age succeeded age, form after form of animal and plant life perished in the unfolding of the great plan of development, while suspended sands of that primeval sea sunk slowly down and were stretched in level plains upon the floor of stone. Early in the Jurassic period, an impressive and far-reaching movement of the Earth's crust took place, during which the bed of the ocean rose in crumpled waves towering high in the air and forming the mountain framework of the western United States. The system of upheavals reached as far as middle Wyoming and stretched from Mexico probably into Alaska. Its numerous ridges and chains, having a general northeast trend, were crowded together in one broad zone whose western and most lofty member is the Sierra Nevada. During all of the Cretaceous period, and a part of the Tertiary, the Pacific beat upon its seaward foothills, tearing to pieces the rocks, crumbling and grinding the shores, and drifting the powdered stone and pebbles beneath its waves, scattered them again in layers. This submarine tableland fringed the whole base of the range, and extended westward an unknown distance under the sea. To this perpetual sea-wearing of the Sierra Nevada base was added the detritus made by the cutting out of canyons, 
which in great volumes continually poured into the Pacific and was arranged upon its bottom by currents. In the late tertiary period, a chapter of very remarkable events occurred. For a second time, the evenly laid beds of the sea bottom were crumpled by the shrinking of the earth. The ocean flowed back into deeper and narrower limits, and fronting the Sierra Nevada appeared the present system of coast ranges. The intermediate depression, or sea trough, as I like to call it, is the Valley of California, and is therefore a more recent continental feature than the Sierra Nevada. At once, then, from the folded rocks of the coast ranges, from the Sierra summits and the inland plateaus, and from numberless vents caused by the fierce dynamical action, there poured out a general deluge of melted rock. From the bottom of the sea sprung up those fountains of lava, whose cooled material forms many of the islands of the Pacific and all along the coast of America, like a system of answering beacons, blazed up volcanic chimneys. The rent mountains glowed with outpourings of molten stone. Sheets of lava poured down the slopes of the Sierra, covering an immense proportion of its surface, only the high granite and metamorphic peaks reaching above the deluge. Rivers and lakes floated up in a cloud of steam and were gone forever. The misty sky of these volcanic days glowed with innumerable lurid reflections, and at intervals along the crest of the range, great cones arose, blackening the sky with their plumes of mineral smoke. At length, having exhausted themselves, the volcanoes burned lower and lower, and at last, by far the greater number went out altogether. With a tendency to extremes, which development geologists would hesitate to admit, nature passed under the dominion of ice and snow. The vast amount of ocean water, which had been vaporized, floated over the land, condensed upon hilltops, chilled the lavas, and finally buried beneath an icy covering all the higher parts of the mountain system. According to well-known laws, the overburdened summits unloaded themselves by a system of glaciers. The whole Sierra crest was one pile of snow, from whose base crawled out the ice rivers, wearing their bodies into the rock, sculpturing as they went the forms of valleys, and brightening the surface of their tracks by the friction of stones and sand which were bedded, armor-like, in their nether surface. Having made their way down the slope of the Sierra, they met a lowland temperature of sufficient warmth to arrest and waste them. At last, from causes which are too intricate to be discussed at present, they shrank slowly back into the higher summit fastnesses, and there gradually perished, leaving only a crest of snow. The ice melted, and upon the whole plateau, little by little, a thin layer of soil accumulated, and replacing the snow, there sprang up a forest of pines, whose shadows fall pleasantly today over rocks which were once torrents of lava and across the burnished pathways of ice. Rivers, pure and sparkling, thread the bottom of these gigantic glacier valleys. The volcanoes are extinct, and the whole theater of this impressive geological drama is now the most glorious and beautiful region of America. As the characters of the Zauberflut pass safely through the trial of fire and the desperate ordeal of water, so, through the terror of volcanic fires and the chilling empire of ice, has the great Sierra come into the present age of tranquil grandeur. Again, five distinct periods divide the history of the range. First, the slow gathering of marine sediment within the early ocean, during which incalculable ages were consumed. Second, in the early Jurassic period, this level sea floor came suddenly to be lifted into the air and crumpled in folds, through whose yawning fissures and ruptured axes outpoured wide zones of granite. 
Third, the volcanic age of fire and steam. Fourth, the glacial period, when the Sierras were one broad field of snow, with huge dragons of ice crawling down its slopes and wearing their armor into the rocks. Fifth, the present condition, which the following chapters will describe, albeit in a desultory and inadequate manner. From latitude 35 degrees to latitude 39 degrees 30 minutes, the Sierra lifts a continuous chain, the profile culminating in several groups of peaks separated by deep depressed curves or sharp notches, the summits varying from 8 to 15,000 feet, 7 to 12,000 being the common range of passes. Near its southern extremity, in San Bernardino County, the range is cleft to the base with magnificent gateways opening into the desert. From Walker's Pass, for 200 miles northward, the skyline is more uniformly elevated, the passes averaging 9,000 feet high, the actual summit a chain of peaks from 13 to 15,000 feet. The serrated snow and granite outline of the Sierra Nevada, projected against the cold, clear blue, is the blade of white teeth which suggested its Spanish name. Northward still, the range gradually sinks. High peaks covered with perpetual snow are rarer and rarer. Its summit rolls on in broken, forest-covered ridges, now and then overlooked by a solitary pile of metamorphic or eruptive rock. At length in northern California, where it breaks down in a compressed medley of ridges and open, level expanses of plain, the axis is maintained by a line of extinct volcanoes standing above the lowland in isolated positions. The most lofty of these, Mount Shasta, is a cone of lava 14,440 feet high, its broad base girdled with noble forests, which give way at 8,000 feet to a cap of glaciers and snow. Beyond this to the northward, the extension of the range is quite difficult to definitely assign, for, geologically speaking, the Sierra Nevada system occupies a broad area in Oregon, consisting of several prominent mountain groups, while in a physical sense the chain ceases with Shasta. The Cascades, which are the apparent topographical continuation, being a tertiary structure formed chiefly of lavas which have been outpoured long subsequent to the main upheaval of the Sierra. It is not easy to point out the actual southern limit either, because where the mountain mass descends into the Colorado desert, it comes in contact with a number of lesser groups of hills, which ramify in many directions, all losing themselves beneath the tertiary and quaternary beds of the desert. For 400 miles, the Sierras are a definite ridge, broad and high, and having the form of a sea wave. Buttresses of somber-hued rock, jutting at intervals from a steep wall, form the abrupt eastern slopes. Irregular forests and scattered growth huddle together near the snow. The lower declivities are barren spurs, sinking into the sterile flats of the Great Basin. Long ridges of comparatively gentle outline characterize the western side, but this sloping table is scored from summit to base by a system of parallel transverse canyons, distant from one another, often less than 25 miles. They are ordinarily two or 3,000 feet deep, falling at times in sheer, smooth-fronted cliffs, again in sweeping curves like the hull of a ship, again in rugged V-shaped gorges, or with irregular hilly flanks, opening at last through gateways of low, rounded foothills, out upon the horizontal plain of the San Joaquin and Sacramento. Every canyon carries a river, derived from constant melting of the perpetual snow, which threads its way down the mountain, a feeble type of those vast ice streams and torrents that formerly discharged the summit accumulation of ice and snow 
while carving the canyons out from solid rock. Nowhere on the continent of America is there more positive evidence of the cutting power of rapid streams than in these very canyons. Although much is due to this cause, the most impressive passages of the Sierra Valleys are actual ruptures of the rock, either the engulfment of masses of great size, as Professor Whitney supposes an explanation of the peculiar form of the Yosemite, or a splitting asunder in yawning cracks. From the summits, down half the distance to the plains, the canyons are also carved out in broad, round curves by glacial action. The summit gorges themselves are altogether the result of frost and ice. Here, even yet, may be studied the mode of blocking out mountain peaks, the cracks riven by unequal contraction and expansion of the rock, the slow leverage of ice, the storm, the avalanche. The western descent, facing a moisture-laden aerial current from the Pacific, condenses on its higher portions a greater amount of water, which is piled upon the summits in the form of snow, and is absorbed upon the upper plateau by an exuberant growth of forest. This prevalent wind, which during most undisturbed periods blows continuously from the ocean, strikes first upon the western slope of the coast range, and there discharges, both as fog and rain, a very great sum of moisture. But being ever reinforced, it blows over their crest, and hurrying eastward, strikes the Sierras at about 4,000 feet above sea level. Below this line, the foothills are oppressed by a habitual dryness, which produces a rusty olive tone throughout nearly all the large conspicuous vegetation, scorches the red soil, and during the long summer overlays the whole region with a cloud of dust. Dull and monotonous in color, there are, however, certain elements of picturesqueness in this lower zone. Its oak-clad hills wander out into the great plain like coast promontories, enclosing yellow, or in springtime green, bays of prairie. The hill forms are rounded, or stretch in long longitudinal ridges, broken across by the river canyons. Above this zone of red earth, softly mottled undulations and dull grayish groves, with a chain of mining towns, dotted ranches, and vineyards, rise the swelling middle height of the Sierras, a broad, billowy plateau cut by sharp, sudden canyons, and sweeping up, with its dark, superb growth of coniferous forest, to the feet of the summit peaks. For a breadth of forty miles, all along the chain, is spread this continuous belt of pines. From Walker's Pass to Sitka, one may ride through an unbroken forest, and will find its character and aspect vary constantly in strict accordance with the laws of altitude and moisture, each of the several species of coniferous trees taking its position with an almost mathematical precision, where low gaps in the coast range give free access to the western wind, there the forest sweeps downward and encamps upon the foothills, and, continuing northward, it advances toward the coast, securing for itself, over this whole distance, about the same physical conditions, so that a tree which finds itself at home on the shore of Puget Sound, in the latitude of Middle California, has climbed the Sierras to a height of 6,000 feet, finding there its normal requirements of damp, cool air. As if to economize the whole surface of the Sierra, the forest is mainly made up of 12 species of coniferae, each having its own definitely circumscribed limits of temperature, and yet being able successively to occupy the whole middle Sierra up to the foot of the perpetual snow. The average range and altitude of each species is about 2,500 feet, so that you pass imperceptibly from the zone of one species into that of the next. Frequently, three or four are commingled. Their varied habit, 
characteristic foliage and richly colored trunks uniting to make the most stately of forests. In the center of the coniferous belt is assembled the most remarkable family of trees. Those which approach the perpetual snow are imperfect, gnarled, and storm-bent, full of character and suggestion, but lacking the symmetry, the rich living green, and the great size of their lower neighbors. In the other extreme of the pine belt, growing side by side with foothill oaks, is an equally imperfect species, which, although attaining a very great size, still has the air of an abnormal tree. The conditions of drought, on the one hand, and rigorous storms on the other, injure and blast alike, while the more verdant center, furnishing the finest conditions, produces a forest whose profusion and grandeur fill the traveler with the liveliest admiration. Toward the south, the growth of the forest is more open and grove-like, the individual trees becoming proportionally larger and reaching their highest development. Northward, its density increases to the injury of individual pines until the branches finally interlock, and at last on the shores of British Columbia, the trunks are so densely assembled that a dead tree is held in its upright position by the arms of its fellows. At the one extremity are magnificent purple shafts ornamented with an exquisitely delicate drapery of pale golden and dark blue green. At the other, the slender spars stand crowded together like the fringe of masts girdling a prosperous port. The one is a great continuous grove, on whose sunny openings are innumerable brilliant parterres. The other is a dismal thicket, a sort of gigantic cane break, void of beauty, dark, impenetrable, save by the avenue of streams, where one may float for days between somber walls of forest. From one to the other of these extremes is an imperceptible transition. Only in the passage of hundreds of miles does the forest seem to thicken northward, or the majesty of the single trees appear to be impaired by their struggle for room. Near the center is the perfection of forest. At the south are the finest specimen trees, at the north the densest accumulations of timber. In riding throughout this whole region and watching the same species from the glorious ideal life of the south gradually dwarf toward the north until it becomes a mere wand, or in climbing from the scattered, drought-scourged pines of the foothills, up through the zone of finest vegetation to those summit crags, where, struggling against the power of tempest and frost, only a few of the bravest trees succeed in clinging to the rocks and to life, one sees, with novel effect, the inexorable sway which climatic conditions hold over the kingdom of trees. Looking down from the summit, the forest is a closely woven vesture which has fallen over the body of the range, clinging closely to its form, sinking into the deep canyons, covering the hilltops with even velvety folds, and only lost here and there where a bold mass of rock gives it no foothold, or where around the margin of the mountain lakes bits of alpine meadow lie open to the sun. Along its upper limit, the forest zone grows thin and irregular. Black shafts of alpine, pines, and firs, clustering on sheltered slopes, or climbing in disordered processions up broken and rocky faces. Higher, the last gnarled forms are passed, and beyond stretches the rank of silent, white peaks, a region of rock and ice lifted above the limit of life. In the north, domes and cones of volcanic formation are the summit, but for about 300 miles in the south, it is a succession of sharp granite agiles and crags. Prevalent among the granitic forms are singularly perfect conoidal domes whose symmetrical figures were it not for their immense size, 
would impress one as having an artificial finish. The alpine gorges are usually wide and open, leading into amphitheaters, whose walls are either rock or drifts of never-melting snow. The sculpture of the summit is very evidently glacial. Beside the ordinary phenomenon of polished rocks and moraines, the larger general forms are clearly the work of frost and ice. And although this ice period is only feebly represented today, yet the frequent avalanches of winter and freshly scored mountain flanks are constant suggestions of the past. Strikingly contrasted are the two countries bordering the Sierra on either side. Along the western base is the plain of California, an elliptical basin 450 miles long by 65 broad, level, fertile, well-watered, half tropically warmed, checkered with farms of grain, ranches of cattle, orchard and vineyard, and homes of commonplace opulence, towns of bustling thrift. Rivers flow over it, bordered by lines of oaks which seem characterless or gone to sleep when compared with the vitality, the spring, and attitude of the same species higher up on the foothills. It is a region of great industrial future, within a narrow range, but quite without charms for the student of science. It has a certain impressive breadth when seen from some overlooking eminence, or when in early spring its brilliant carpet of flowers lies as a foreground over which the dark pine land and white crest of the Sierra loom indistinctly. From the Mexican frontier up into Oregon, a strip of actual desert lies under the east slope of the Great Chain and stretches eastward sometimes as far as 500 miles, varied by successions of bare white ground effervescing under the hot sun with alkaline salts, plains covered by the low, ashy-hued sage plant, high, barren, rocky ranges, which are folds of metamorphic rocks, and piled-up lavas of bright red or yellow colors, all overarched by a sky which is at one time of a hot metallic brilliancy and again the tenderest of evanescent purple or pearl. Utterly opposed are the two aspects of the Sierras from these east and west approaches. I remember how stern and strong the chain looked to me when I first saw it from the Colorado desert. It was early May, 1866. My companion, Mr. James T. Gardner, and I got into the saddle on the bank of the Colorado River and headed westward over the road from La Paz to San Bernardino. My mount was a tough, magnanimous sort of mule who at all times did his very best. That of my friend, an animal still hardier, but altogether wanting in moral attributes. He developed a singular antipathy for my mule and utterly refused to march within a quarter of a mile of me, so that over a wearying route of 300 miles, we were obliged to travel just beyond the reach of a shout. Hour after hour, plodding along at a dog trot, we pursued our solitary way without the spice of companionship and altogether deprived of the melodramatic satisfaction of loneliness. Far ahead of us, a white line traced across the barren plain marked our road. It seemed to lead nowhere except onward over more and more arid reaches of desert. Rolling hills of crude color and low, gloomy contour rose above the general level. Here and there, the eye was arrested by a towering crag or an elevated rocky mountain group whose naked sides sank down into the desert, unrelieved by the shade of a solitary tree. The whole aspect of nature was dull in color and gloomy with an all-pervading silence of death. Although the summer had not fairly opened, a torrid sun beat down with cruel severity, blinding the eye with its brilliance and inducing a painful slow fever. The very plants, scorched to a crisp, 
were ready at the first blast of a sirocco to be whirled away and ground to dust. Certain bare zones lay swept clean of the last dry stems across our path, marking the track of whirlwinds. Water was only found at intervals of sixty or seventy miles, and when reached was more of an aggravation than a pleasure. Bitter, turbid, and scarce. We rode for it all day and berated it all night, only to leave it at sunrise with the secret fear that we might fare worse the next time. About noon on the third day of our march, having reached the borders of the Chabazon Valley, we emerged from a rough, rocky gateway in the mountains, and I paused while my companion made up his quarter of a mile, that we might hold counsel and determine our course for the water question was becoming serious. Springs which look cool and seductive on our maps, proving to be dried up and obsolete upon the ground. A fresh mule and a lively man get along to be sure well enough, but, after all, it is at best with perfunctory tolerance on both sides, a sort of diplomatic interchange of argument, the man suggesting with bridle, or mildly admonishing with spurs, but when the high contracting parties get tired, the entente cordiale goes to pieces, and actual hostilities open, in which I never knew a man to come out the better. I had noticed a shambling uncertainty during the last half-hour's trot, and those invariable indicators, John's long furry ears, either lopped diagonally down on one side, or lay back with ill omen upon his neck. Gardner reached me in a few minutes, and we dismounted to rest the tired mules and to scan the landscape before us. We were on the margin of a great basin, whose gently shelving rim sank from our feet to a perfectly level plain, which stretched southward as far as the eye could reach, bounded by a dim, level horizon, like the sea, but walled in to the west, at a distance of about forty miles, by the high frowning wall of the Sierras. This plain was a level floor as white as marble, and into it the rocky spurs from our own mountain range descended, like promontories into the sea. Wide, deeply indented white bays wound in and out among the foothills, and, traced upon the barren slopes of this rocky coast, was marked, at a considerable elevation above the plain, the shoreline of an ancient sea, a white stain defining its former margin as clearly as if the water had but just receded. On the dim distant base of the Sierras, the same primeval beach could be seen. This water mark the level white valley, and the utter absence upon its surface of any vegetation gave a strange and weird aspect to the country, as if a vast tide had but just ebbed, and the brilliant scorching sun had hurriedly dried up its last traces of moisture. In the indistinct glare of the southern horizon, it needed but slight aid from the imagination to see a lifting and tumbling of billows as if the old tide were coming, but they were only shudderings of heat. As we sat there surveying this unusual scene, the white expanse became suddenly transformed into a placid blue sea, along whose rippling shores were the white blocks of roofs, groups of spire-crowned villages, and cool stretches of green grove. A soft, vapory atmosphere hung over this sea. Shadows, purple and blue, floated slowly across it, producing the most enchanting effect of light and color. The dreamy richness of the tropics, the serene sapphire sky of the desert, and the cool purple distance of mountains were grouped as by miracle. It was as if nature were about to repay us a hundredfold for the lie she had given the topographers and their maps. In a moment, the illusion vanished. It was gone, leaving the white desert unrelieved by a shadow. A blaze of white light falling full on the plain 
the sun-struck air reeling in whirlwind columns white with the dust of the desert up up and vanishing into the sky waves of heat rolled like billows across the valley the old shores became indistinct the whole lowland unreal shades of misty blue crossed over it and disappeared lakes with ragged shores gleamed out reflecting the sky and in a moment disappeared the bewildering effect of this natural magic and perhaps the feverish thirst produced the impression of a dream which might have taken fatal possession of us but for the importunate braying of gardner's mule whose piteous discords for he made three noises at once banished all hallucination and brought us gently back from the mysterious spectacle to the practical question of water we had but one canteen of that precious elixir left the elixir in this case being composed of one part pure water one part sand one part alum one part saleratus with liberal traces of colorado mud representing a very disgusting taste and a very great range of geological formations to search for the mountain springs laid down upon our maps was probably to find them dry and afforded us little more inducement than to chase the mirages the only well-known water was at an oasis somewhere on the margin of the chabazon and should if the information was correct have been in sight from our resting place we eagerly scanned the distance, but were unable, among the phantom lakes and the ever-changing illusions of the desert, to fix upon any probable point. Indian trails led out in all directions, and our only clue to the right path was far in the northwest, where, looming against the sky, stood two conspicuous mountain piles lifted above the general wall of the Sierra their bases rooted in the desert, and their precipitous fronts rising boldly on each side of an open gateway. The two summits, high above the magical stratum of desert air, were sharply defined and singularly distinct in all the details of rock form and snow field. From their position, we knew them to be the walls of the San Gorgonio Pass, and through this gateway lay our road. After brief deliberation, we chose what seemed to be the most beaten road leading in that direction, and I mounted my mule and started, leaving my friend patiently seated in his saddle, waiting for the afflatus of his mule to take effect. Thus we rode down into the desert, and hour after hour traveled silently on, straining our eyes forward to a spot of green which we hoped might mark our oasis, so incredulous had I become that I prided myself upon having penetrated the flimsy disguise of an unusually deceptive mirage and philosophized to a considerable extent upon the superiority of my reason over the instinct of the mule whose quickened pace and nervous manner showed him to be, as I thought, a dupe. Wherever there comes to be a clearly defined mental issue between man and mule, the stubbornness of the latter is the expression of an adamantine moral resolve founded in eternal right. The man is invariably wrong. Thus on this occasion, as at a thousand other times, I was obliged to own up worsted, and I drummed for a while with Spanish spurs upon the ribs of my conqueror, that being my habitual mode of covering my retreat. It was the oasis, and not the mirage. John lifted up his voice, now many days hushed, and gave out spasmodic gusts of baritone, which were as dry and harsh as if he had drunk mirages only. The heart of Gardner's mule relented. Of his own accord, he galloped up to my side, and for the first time together, we rode forward to the margin of the oasis. Under the palms, we hastily threw off our saddles and allowed the parched brutes to drink their fill. We lay down in the grass, drank, bathed our faces, and played in the water like children. We picketed our mules knee-deep in the freshest of grass, and, 
unpacking our saddlebags, sent up a smoke to heaven, and achieved that most precious solace of the desert traveler, a pot of tea. By and by, we plunged into the pool, which was perhaps thirty feet long and deep enough to give us a pleasant swim. The water being almost blood warm, we absorbed it in every pore, dilated like sponges, and came out refreshed. It is well worth having one's juices broiled out by a desert sun just to experience the renewal of life from a mild parboil. That abouts man with the broken ear, under the same aqueous renovation, was ready to fall in love with his granddaughter, no longer appears to me odd. Our oasis spread out its disk of delicate green, sharply defined upon the enamel-like desert which stretched away for leagues, simple, unbroken, pathetic. Near the eastern edge of this garden, whose whole surface, covered hardly more than an acre, rose two palms, interlocking their cool, dark foliage over the pool of pure water. A low, deserted cabin, with wide, overhanging flat roof, which had long ago been thatched with palm leaves, stood close by the trees. With its isolation, its strange, warm fountain, its charming vegetation varied with grasses, trailing water plants, bright parterres in which were minute flowers of turquoise blue, pale gold, mauve, and rose, and its two graceful palms, this oasis evoked a strange sentiment. I have never felt such a sense of absolute and remote seclusion. The hot, trackless plain and distant groups of mountains shut it away from all the world. Its humid and fragrant air hung over us in delicious contrast with the oven breath through which we had ridden. Weary little birds alighted, panting, and drank and drank again, without showing the least fear of us. Wild doves, fluttering down, bathed in the pool and fed about among our mules. After straining over one hundred and fifty miles of silent desert, hearing no sound but the shoes of our mules grating upon hot sand, after the white glare and that fever thirst which comes from drinking alkali water, it was a deep pleasure to lie under the palms and look up at their slow-moving green fans and hear in those shaded recesses the mild, sweet twittering of our traveler friends, the birds, who stayed like ourselves, overcome with the languor of perfect repose. Declining rapidly toward the west, the sun warned us to renew our journey. Several hours' rest and frequent deep draughts of water added to the feast of succulent grass, filled out and rejuvenated our saddle animals. John was far less an anatomical specimen than when I unsaddled him, and Gardner's mule came up to be bridled with so mollified a demeanor that it occurred to us as just possible he might forget his trick of lagging behind, but with the old tenacity of purpose he planted his forefeet and waited till I was well out in the desert. As I rode, I watched the western prospect. Completely bounding the basin in that direction rose the gigantic wall of the Sierra, its serrated line sharply profiled against the evening sky. This dark barrier became more and more shadowed so that the old shore line and the lowland where mountain and plain joined were lost. The desert melted in the distance into the shadowed masses of the Sierra, which, looming higher and higher, seemed to rise as the sun went down. Scattered snow fields shone along its crest, each peak and notch, every column of rock and detail of outline were black and sharp. On either side of the San Gorgonio stood its two guardian peaks, San Bernardino and San Jacinto, capped with rosy snow, and the pass itself, warm with western light, opened hopefully before us. For a moment the sun rested upon the Sierra crest, and then, slowly sinking, 
suffered eclipse by its ragged black profile. Through the slow hours of darkening twilight, a strange ashy gloom overspread the desert, the forms of the distant mountain chains behind us, and the old shoreline upon the Sierra base stared at us with a strange, weird distinctness. At last all was gray and vague, except the black silhouette of the Sierras cut upon a band of golden heaven. We at length reached their foot, and turning northward, rode parallel with the base of the San Gorgonio, in the moonless night, huge rocky buttresses of the range loomed before us, their feet plunging into the pale desert floor. High upon their fronts, perhaps five hundred feet above us, was dimly traceable the white line of ancient shore. Over drifted hills of sand and hard alkaline clay, we rode along the bottom of that primitive sea. Between the spurs, Deep mountain alcoves, stretching back into the heart of the range, open grand and shadowy. Far at their head, over crest of ridge and peak, loomed the planet Jupiter. A long, wearisome ride of forty hours brought us to the open San Gorgonio Pass. Already, scattered beds of flowers tinted the austere face of the desert. Tufts of pale grass grew about the stones, and Tall stems of yucca bore up their magnificent bunches of bluish flowers. Upon all the heights overhanging the road, gnarled struggling cedars grasped the rock and stretched themselves with frantic effort to catch a breath of the fresh Pacific vapor. It is instructive to observe the difference between those which lean out into the vitalizing wind of the pass and the faded few whose position exposes them to the dry air of the desert. Vigor, soundness, nerve to stand on the edge of sheer walls, flexibility, sap, fullness of green foliage, are in the one. A shroud of dull olive leaves scantily cover the thin, straggling, bayonet-like boughs of the others. They are rigid, shrunken, split to the heart, and pitiful. We were glad to forget them as we turned a last buttress and ascended the gentle acclivity of the pass. Before us opened a broad gateway six or seven miles from wall to wall, in which a mere swell of green land rises to divide the desert and Pacific slopes. Flanking the pass along its northern side stands Mount San Bernardino, its granite framework, crowded up above the beds of more recent rock about its base, bearing aloft tattered fragments of pine forest, the summit piercing through a marbling of perpetual snow up to the height of 10,000 feet. Fronting it, on the opposite wall, rises its compeer, San Jacinto, a dark crag of lava, whose flanks are cracked, riven, and water-worn, into innumerable ravines, each catching a share of the drainage from the snow cap and glistening with a hundred small waterfalls. Numerous brooks unite to form two rivers, one running down the green slope among ranches and gardens into the blooming valley of San Bernardino, the other pouring eastward, shrinking as it flows out upon the hot sands, till in a few miles the unslakable desert has drunk it dry. There are but few points in America where such extremes of physical condition meet. What contrast, what opposed sentiments the two views awakened! Spread out below us lay the desert, stark and staring, its rigid hill chains lying in disordered grouping, in attitudes of the dead. The bare hills are cut out with sharp gorges, and over their stone skeletons, scanty earth clings and folds like shrunken flesh. They are emaciated courses of once noble ranges, now lifeless, outstretched as in a long sleep. Ghastly colors define them from the ashen plain in which their feet are buried. 
Far in the south were a procession of whirlwind columns slowly moving across the desert in spectral dimness. A white light beat down, dispelling the last trace of shadow, and above hung the burnished shield of hard, pitiless sky. Sinking to the west from our feet, the gentle golden green glacis sloped away, flanked by rolling hills, covered with a fresh vernal carpet of grass and relieved by scattered groves of dark oak trees. Upon the distant valley were checkered fields of grass and grain, just tinged with the first ripening yellow. The bounding coast ranges lay in the cool shadow of a bank of mist which drifted in from the Pacific, covering their heights. Flocks of bright clouds floated across the sky, whose blue was palpitating with light and seemed to rise with infinite perspective. Tranquility, abundance, the slow, beautiful unfolding of plant life, dark-shadowed spots to rest our tired eyes upon, the shade of giant oaks to lie down under, while listening to brooks, contralto larks, and the soft distant lowing of cattle. I have given the outlines of aspect along our ride across the Chabazon, omitting many amusing incidents and some genre pictures of rare interest among the Cahuilla Indians, as I wish simply to illustrate the relations of the Sierra with the country bordering its east base, the barrier looming above a desert. In Nevada, in California, farther north, this wall rises more grandly, but its face rests upon a modified form of desert plains of less extent than the Colorado and usually covered with sage plants and other brushy compositae of equally pitiful appearance. Large lakes of complicated saline waters are dotted under the Sierra shadow. The ancient terraces built upon foothill and outlying volcanic ranges indicating their former expansion into inland seas and farther north still, where plains extend east of Mount Shasta, level sheets of lava form the country, and open, black, rocky channels from the numerous branches of the Sacramento and Klamath. Approaching the Sierras anywhere from the west, you will perceive a totally different topographical and climatic condition. From the coast range peaks especially, one obtains an extended and impressive prospect. I had fallen behind the party one May evening of our march across Pacheco's Pass, partly because some wind-bent oaks trailing almost horizontally over the wild oat surface of the hills, and marking as a living record the prevalent west wind, had arrested me and called out compass and notebook, and because there had fallen to my lot an incorrigibly deliberate mustang, to whom I had abandoned myself to be carried along at his own pace, comforted withal that I should get in too late to have any hand in the cooking of supper. We reached the crest, the mustang coming to a conspicuous and unwarrantable halt. I yielded, however, and sat still in the saddle, looking out to the east. Brown foothills, purple over their lower slopes with fillery blossoms, descended steeply to the plain of California, a great inland prairie sea extending for 500 miles, mountain-locked between the Sierras and coast hills, and now a broad arabesque surface of colors. Miles of orange-colored flowers, cloudings of green and white, reaches of violet, which looked like the shadow of a passing cloud, wandering in natural patterns over and through each other, sunny and intense along near our range, fading in the distance into pale bluish pearl tones, and divided by long, dimly seen rivers whose margins were edged by belts of bright emerald green. Beyond rose three hundred miles of Sierra, half lost in light and cloud and mist, the summit in places sharply seen against a pale barrel sky and again buried in warm, rolling clouds. It was a mass of strong light, soft, fathomless shadows, and 
dark regions of forest. However, the three belts upon its front were tolerably clear. Dusky foothills rose over the plain with a coppery gold tone, suggesting the line of mining towns planted in its dusty ravines, a suggestion I was glad to repel, and look higher into that cool, solemn realm where the pines stand, green-roofed, an infinite colonnade. Lifted above the bustling industry of the plains and the melodramatic mining theater of the foothills, it has a grand, silent life of its own, refreshing to contemplate even from a hundred miles away. While I looked, the sun descended, shadows climbed the Sierras, casting a gloom over foothill and pine until at last only the snow summits reflecting the evening light, glowed like red lamps along the mountain wall for hundreds of miles. The rest of the Sierra became invisible. The snow burned for a moment in the violet sky and at last went out. End of chapter one. The Range. Chapter 2 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Through the Forest. Vizalia is the name of a small town embowered in oaks upon the Tulare Plain in Middle California, where we made our camp one May evening of 1864. Professor Whitney, our chief, the state geologist, had sent us out for a summer's campaign in the high Sierras, under the lead of Professor William H. Brewer, who was more skeptical than I as to the result of the mission. Several times during the previous winter, Mr. Hoffman and I, while on duty at the Mariposa gold mines, had climbed to the top of Mount Bullion and gained, in those clear January days, a distinct view of the high Sierra ranging from the Mount Lyell group many miles south to a vast pile of white peaks which, from our estimate, should lie near the heads of the Kings and Cahuilla rivers. Of their great height I was fully persuaded, and Professor Whitney, on the strength of these few observations, commissioned us to explore and survey the new Alps. We numbered five in camp, Professor Brewer, Mr. Charles F. Hoffman, Chief Topographer, Mr. James T. Gardner, Assistant Surveyor, myself, Assistant Geologist, and our man of all work, to whom science already owes its debts. When we got together our outfit of mules and equipment of all kinds, Brewer was going to re-engage, as general aid, a certain Dane, Jan Hesch, who besides being a faultless mule packer, was a rapid and successful financier, having twice, when the field purse was low and remittances delayed, enriched us by what he called dealing bottom stock in his little evening games with the honest miners. Not ungrateful for that, I, however, detested the fellow with great cordiality. If I don't take him, "'Will you be responsible for packing mules and for daily bread?' said Brewer to me, the morning of our departure from Oakland. "'I will. "'Then we'll take your man Cotter, only, when the pack saddles roll under the mules' bellies, "'I shall light my pipe and go botanizing, sabe?' "'So my friend Richard Cotter came into the service,' and the accomplished but filthy Jan opened a poker and rum shop on one of the San Francisco wharves, where he still mixes drinks and puts up jobs of bottom stock. Secretly, I longed for him as we came down the Pacheco Pass, the packs having loosened with provoking frequency. The animals of our small exploring party were upon a footing of easy social equality with us, all were excellent except mine. The choice of Hobson, whom I take to have been the youngest member of some company, falling naturally to me, I came to be possessed of the only hopeless animal in the band. Old Slum, a dignified roan mustang of a certain age, 
with the decorum of years and a conspicuous economy of force, retain not a few of the affectations of youth, such as snorting theatrically and shying, though with absolute safety to the writer, Professor Brewer. Hoffman's mount was a young half-breed, full of fire and gentleness. The mare Bess, my friend Gardner's pet, was a light bay creature, as full of spring and perception as her sex and species may be. A rare mule, Kate, carried Cotter. Nell and Jim, two old geological mules, branded with Mexican hieroglyphics from head to tail, were bearers of the loads. Mine, Buckskin, was incorrigibly bad. To begin with, his anatomy was desultory and incoherent, the maximum of physical effort bringing about a slow, shambling gait quite unendurable. He was further cursed with a brain, wanting the elements of logic as evinced by such non sequiturs as shying insanely at wisps of hay and stampeding beyond control when I tried to tie him to a load of grain. My sole amusement with Buckskin grew out of a psychological peculiarity of his, namely, the unusual slowness with which waves of sensation were propelled inward toward the brain from remote parts of his periphery. A dig of the spurs administered in the flank passed unnoticed for a period of time, varying from 12 to 13 seconds, till the protoplasm of the brain received the percussive wave then, with the suddenness, which I never wholly got over, he would dash into a trot, nearly tripping himself up with his own astonishment. A stroke of good fortune completed our outfit, and my happiness, by bringing to Vizalia a Spaniard who was under some manner of financial cloud. His horse was offered for sale, and quickly bought for me by Professor Brewer. We named him Coia, after the river and its Indian tribe. He was young, strong, fleet, elegant, a pattern of fine modeling in every part of his bay body and fine black legs, every way good, only fearfully wild, with a blaze of quick electric light in his dark eye. Shortly after sunrise, one fresh morning, we made a point of putting the packs on very securely and getting into our saddles rode out toward the Sierras. The group of farms surrounding Vizalia is gathered within a belt through which several natural and many more artificial channels of the Cahuilla flow. Groves of large, dark-foliaged oaks follow this irrigated zone. The roads, nearly always in shadow, are flanked by small ranch houses, fenced in with rank jungles of weeds and rows of decrepit pickets. There is about these fresh ruins, these specimens of modern decay, an air of social decomposition not pleasant to perceive. Freshly built houses, still untinted by time, left in rickety disorder, half-finished windows, gates broken down or unhinged, and a kind of sullen neglect staring everywhere. What more can I say of the people than that they are chiefly southern immigrants who subsist upon pork? Rare exceptions of comfort and thrift shine out sometimes with neat dooryards, well-repaired dwellings, and civilized-looking children. In these, I never saw the mother of the family sitting cross-legged, smoking a corncob pipe, nor the father loafing about with a fiddle or shotgun. Our backs were now turned to this farm belt, the road leading us out upon the open plain in our first full sight of the Sierras. Grand and cool swelled up the forest. Sharp and rugged rose the wave of white peaks, their vast fields of snow rolling over the summit in broad, shining masses. Sunshine, exuberant vegetation, brilliant plant life, occupied our attention hour after hour until the middle of the second day. At last, after climbing a long, weary ascent, we rode out of the dazzling light of the foothills into a region of dense woodland, 
the road winding through avenues of pines so tall that the late evening light only came down to us in scattered rays. Under the deep shade of these trees we found an air pure and gratefully cool. Passing from the glare of the open country into the dusky forest, one seems to enter a door and ride into a vast covered hall. The whole sensation is of being roofed and enclosed. You are never tired of gazing down long vistas where, in stately groups, stand tall shafts of pine. Columns they are, each with its own characteristic tinting and finish, yet all standing together with the air of relationship and harmony. Feathery branches, trimmed with living green, wave through the upper air, opening broken glimpses of the far blue and catching on their polished surfaces reflections of the sun. Broad streams of light pour in, gilding purple trunks and falling in bright pathways along an undulating floor. Here and there are wide open spaces around which the trees group themselves in majestic ranks. Our eyes often ranged upward, the long shafts leading the vision up to green lighted spires and on to the clouds. All that is dark and cool and grave in color, the beauty of blue umbrageous distance, all the sudden brilliance of strong local lights tinted upon green boughs or red and fluted shafts surround us in ever-changing combination as we ride along these winding roadways of the Sierra. We had marched a few hours over high, rolling, wooded ridges, when in the late afternoon we reached the brow of an eminence and began to descend. Looking over the tops of the trees beneath us, we saw a mountain basin, 1,500 feet deep, surrounded by a rim of pine-covered hills. An even, unbroken wood covered these sweeping slopes down to the very bottom, and in the midst, open to the sun, lay a circular green meadow, about a mile in diameter. As we descended, side wood tracks, marked by the deep ruts of timber wagons, joined our road on either side, and in the course of an hour we reached the basin and saw the distant roofs of Thomas's sawmill ranch. We crossed the level disk of meadow, fording a clear, cold mountain stream, flowing, as the best brooks do, over clean white granite sand, and near the northern margin of the valley, upon a slight eminence, in the edge of a magnificent forest, pitched our camp. The hills to the westward already cast down a somber shadow, which fell over the eastern hills and across the meadow, dividing the basin half in golden and half in azure green. The tall young grass was living with purple and white flowers. This exquisite carpet sweeps up over the bases of the hills in green undulations and strays far into the forest in irregular fields. A little brooklet passed close by our camp and flowed down the smooth green glacis which led from our little eminence to the meadow. Above us, towered pines 250 feet high, their straight fluted trunks smooth and without a branch for a hundred feet. Above that, and on to the very tops, the green branches stretched out and interwove until they spread a broad leafy canopy from column to column. Professor Brewer determined to make this camp a home for the week, during which we were to explore and study all about the neighborhood. We were on a great granite spur, 60 miles from east to west, by 20 miles wide, which lies between the Cahuilla and King's River canyons. Rising in bold sweeps from the plain, this ridge joins the Sierra summit in the midst of a high group. Experience had taught us that the canyons are impassable by animals for any great distance, so the plan of the campaign was to find a way up over the rocky crest of the spur as far as mules could go. In the little excursions from this camp, which were made usually on horseback, we became acquainted with the forest and got a good knowledge of the topography of a considerable region. 
on the heights above King's Canyon are some singularly fine assemblies of trees. Cotter and I had ridden all one morning northeast from camp under the shadowy roof of forest, catching but occasional glimpses out over the plateau, until at last we emerged upon the bare surface of a ridge of granite and came to the brink of a sharp precipice. Rocky crags lifted just east of us. The hour devoted to climbing them proved well spent. A single little family of alpine firs growing in a niche in the granite surface and partly sheltered by a rock made the only shadow and just shielded us from the intense light as we lay down by their roots. North and south, as far as the eye could reach, heaved the broad green waves of plateau, swelling and merging through endless modulation of slope and form. Conspicuous upon the horizon, about due east of us, was a tall pyramidal mass of granite, trimmed with buttresses which radiated down from its crest, each one ornamented with fantastic spires of rock. Between the buttresses lay stripes of snow, banding the pale granite peak from crown to base. Upon the north side it fell off, grandly precipitous, into the deep upper canyon, of King's River. This gorge, after uniting a number of immense rocky amphitheaters, is carved deeply into the granite two and three thousand feet, in a slightly curved line from the summit. It cuts westward through the plateau, its walls for the most part descending in sharp bare slopes or lines of ragged debris, the resting place of processions of pines. We ourselves were upon the brink of the south wall. Three thousand feet below us lay the valley, a narrow, winding ribbon of green, in which here and there gleamed still reaches of the river. Wherever the bottom widened to a quarter or half a mile, green meadows and extensive groves occupied the level region. Upon every niche and crevice of the walls, up and down sweeping curves of easier descent, or grouped black companies of trees. The behavior of the forest is observed most interestingly from these elevated points above the general face of the tableland. All over the gentle undulations of the more level country sweeps an unbroken covering of trees. Reaching the edge of the canyon precipices, they stand out in bold groups upon the brink and climb all over the more ragged and broken surfaces of granite. Only the most smooth and abrupt precipices are bare. Here and there, a little shelf of a foot or two in width, cracked into the face of the bluff, gives foothold to a family of pines who twist their roots into its crevices and thrive. With no soil from which the roots may drink up moisture and absorb the slowly dissolved mineral particles, they live by breathing alone. Moist vapors from the river below and the elements of the atmosphere affording them the substance of life. I believe no one can study from an elevated lookout the length and depth of one of these great Sierra canyons without asking himself some profound geological questions. Your eyes range along one or the other wall. The average descent is immensely steep. Here and there, side ravines break down the rim in deep lateral gorges. Again, the wall advances in sharp salient precipices, rising two or three thousand feet, sheer and naked, with all the air of a recent fracture. At times, the two walls approach each other, standing in perpendicular gateways. Toward the summits, the canyon grows, perhaps a little broader, and more and more prominent lateral ravines open into it, until at last it receives the snow drainage of the summit which descends through broad, rounded amphitheaters, separated from each other by sharp, castellated, snow-clad ridges. Looking down the course of the river, vertical precipices are seen to be less and less frequent, the walls inclining to each other more and more gently, until they roll out on the north and south in round, wooded ridges. Solid, massive granite forms the material throughout its whole length. 
If you study the topography upon the plateaus above one of these canyons, you will see that the ridges upon one side are reproduced in the other, as if the outlines of wavy tableland topography had been determined before the great canyon was made. It is not easy to propose a solution for this peculiar structure. I think, however, it is safe to say that actual rending asunder of the mountain mass determined the main outlines. Upon no other theory can we account for those blank walls, where, in the upper course of the canyon, they descend in a smooth, ship-like curve, and the rocks bear upon their curved sides the markings and striations of glaciers, it is easy to see that those terrible ice engines gradually modified their form, and toward the foothills the forces of aqueous erosion are clearly indicated in the rounded forms and broad undulations of the two banks. Looking back from our isolated crag in the direction of our morning's ride, we saw the green hills break down into the basin of Thomas's mill, but the disk of meadow lay too deep to be seen. Forests, dense and unbroken, grew to the base of our cliff. The southern sunlight reflected from its polished foliage gave to this whole sea of spiry tops a peculiar golden green, through which we looked down among giant red and purple trunks upon beds of bright mountain flowers. As the afternoon lengthened, the summit rank of peaks glowed warmer and warmer under inclined rays. The granite flushed with rosy brightness between the fields of glittering golden snow. A mild pearly haziness came gradually to obscure the ordinary cloud-blue sky, and settling into canyon depths and among the vast open corridors of the summit, veiled the savage sharpness of their details. I lay several hours sketching the outlines of the summit, studying out the systems of alpine drainage, and getting acquainted with the long chain of peaks, that I might afterward know them from other points of view. I became convinced from the great apparent elevation and the wide fields of snow that we had not formerly deceived ourselves as to their great height. Warned at length by the deepening shadow in the King's Canyon, by the heightened glow suffusing the peaks, and the deep purple tone of the level expanse of forest, all forerunners of twilight, we quitted our eyrie, crept carefully down over half-balanced blocks of debris to the horses, and mounting were soon headed homeward, in what seemed, by contrast, to be almost a nocturnal darkness. Wherever the ground opened level before us, we gave our horses the rein, and went at a free gallop through the forest. The animals realized that they were going home, and pressed forward with the greatest spirit. A good-sized log across our route seemed to be an object of special amusement to Kawea, who seized the bits in his teeth, and dancing up, crouched and cleared it with a mighty bound, in a manner that was indeed inspiring, yet left one but the impression that once was enough of that sort of thing. Fearing some manner of hostilities with him, I did my very best to quiet Kawea, and by the end of an hour had gotten him down to a sensible, serious walk. I noticed that he insisted upon following his tracks of the morning's march, and was not contented unless I let him go on the old side of every tree. Thus I became so thoroughly convinced of his faculty to follow the morning's trail, that I yielded all control of him, giving myself up to the enjoyment of the dimly lighted wood. As the sun at last set, the shadow deepened into an impressive gloom. Mighty trunks rising into that dark region of interlocking boughs only vaguely defined themselves against the twilight sky. We could no longer see our tracks, and the confused rolling topography looked alike whichever way we turned. Kawea strode on in his confident way, and I was at last confirmed as to his sagacity by passing one after another the objects we had noted in the morning. Thus for a couple of hours we rode in the darkness. 
at length the rising moon poured down through broken tents of foliage its uncertain silvery light, which had the effect of deepening all the shadows and lighting up in the strangest manner little local points. Here and there ahead of us, the lighted trees rose like pillars of an ancient temple. The forest, which an hour before overpowered us with the sense of its dark enclosure, opened on in distant avenues as far as the eye could reach. As we rode through denser or more open passages, the moon sailed into clear violet sky, or was obscured again by the sharply traced crests of the pines. Ravines, dark and unfathomable, yawned before us, their flanks half in shadow, half in weird, uncertain light. Blocks of white granite gleamed here and there in contrast with the general depth of shade. At last, descending a hill, there shone before us a red light. The horses plunged forward at a gallop, and in a moment we were in camp. After this ride we supped, relishing our mountain fare, and then lay down upon blankets before a campfire for the mountaineer's short evening. One keeps awake under stimulus of the sparkling frosty air for a while, and then turns in for the night, sleeping till daybreak with a light, sound sleep. The charm of this forest life, in spite of its scientific interest and the constant succession of exquisite, highly colored scenes, would string one's feelings up to a high though monotonous key, were it not for the half-droll, half-pathetic genre picturesqueness which the digger Indians introduce. Upon every stream and on all the finer campgrounds throughout the whole forest are found these families of Indians who migrate up here during the hot weather, fishing, hunting, gathering pine nuts, and lying off with that peculiar bummerish ease which, associated with natural mock dignity, throws about them a singular and not unfrequently deep interest. I never forget certain bright June sunrises, when I have seen the Indian paterfamilias gather together his little tribe and address them in the heroic style concerning the vital importance of the grasshopper crop and the reverence due to the giver of manzanita berries. You come upon them as you travel the trails, proud-stepping braves leading the way, unhampered and free, followed by troops of submissive wives loaded down with immense packages and baskets. Their death and burial customs, too, have elements of weird romantic interest. I remember one morning when I was awakened before dawn by wild, unearthly shrieks ringing through the forest and coming back again in plaintive echoes from the hills all about, beyond description wild, these wails of violent grief followed each other with regular cadence, dying away in long, despairing sobs. With a marvelous regularity they recurred, never varying the simple refrain. My curiosity was aroused so far as to get me out of my blankets, and, after a hurried bath in an icy stream, I joined my mountaineer acquaintance, Jerry, who was en route to the rancheria, to see, as he expressed it, them tar heads howl. It seems my friend Buck, the Indian chief, had the night before lost his wife, Sally the Old, and the shouts came from professional mourners hired by her family to prepare the body and do up the necessary amount of grief. Old widows and superannuated wives, who have outlived other forms of usefulness, gladly enter this singular profession. They cut their hair short, and with each new death plaster on a fresh cap of pitch and ashes, daub the face with spots of tar, and, in general, array themselves as funeral experts. The rancheria was astir when we arrived. It was a mere group of half a dozen smoky hovels, built of pine bark propped upon cones of poles, and arranged in a semicircle within the edge of the forest, fronting on a brook and meadow. Jerry and I leaned our backs against a large tree and watched the group. Buck's shanty was deserted, the body of his wife lying outside upon a blanket, 
being prepared by two of these funeral hags. Buck himself was quietly stuffing his stomach with a breakfast of venison and acorns, which were handed him at brief intervals by several sympathizing women. Turning to Jerry, with a countenance of stolid seriousness, he laconically remarked, My woman, she die. Very bad. Tonight, sundown, pointing to the sun, she burn up. Meanwhile, the tar heads rolled Sally the Old over and over, all the while alternately howling the same dismal phrase. Indian relatives and friends, having the general air of animated rag bags, arrived occasionally and sat down in silence at a fire a little removed from the other diggers, never once saluting them. As we walked back to our camp, I remarked on the stolid, cruel expression of Buck's face, but Jerry, to my surprise, bade me not judge too hastily. He went on to explain that Indians have just as deep and tender attachments, just as much good sense, and to wind up with as much human into them as we educated white folks. His own Indian wife had instilled this into Jerry's naturally sentimental and credulous heart, so I refrain from expressing my convictions concerning Indians, which, I own, were formerly tinged with the most sanguinary Caucasian prejudice. Jerry came for me by appointment just before sunset, and we walked leisurely across the meadow and under lengthening pine shadows to the rancheria. No one was stirring. Buck and the two vicarious mourners sat in his lodge door, uttering low, half-audible groans. In the opening before the line of huts, a low pile of dry logs had been carefully laid, upon which, outstretched and wrapped in a red blanket, lay the dead form of Sally the Old, her face covered in careful folds. Upon her heart were a grass-woven water bowl and her last papoose basket. Just as the sun sank to the horizon, one tar head stepped out in front of the funeral pile, lifted up both hands, and gazed steadily and silently at the sun. She might have been five minutes in this statuesque position, her face full of strange, half-animal intensity of expression, her eyes glittering, the whole hard figure glowing with a deep bronze reflection. Suddenly she sprang back with the old wild shriek, seized a brand from one of the campfires, and lighted the funeral heap, when all the Indians came out and grouped themselves in little knots around it. Sally the old's children clung about an old mummy of a woman who squatted upon the ground and rocked her body to and fro, making a low cry as of an animal in pain. All the Indians looked serious. A group who Jerry said were relatives seemed stupefied with grief. Upon a few faces, falling tears glistened in the light of the fire, which now shot up red tongues high in the air, lighting up with weird distinctness every feature of the whole group. Flames slowly lapped over, consuming the blanket, and caught the willow papoose basket. When Buck saw this, the tears streamed from his eyes. He waved his hands eloquently, looking up to heaven, and uttered heartbroken sobs. The papoose basket crackled for a moment, flashed into a blaze, and was gone. The two old women yelled their sharp death cry, dancing, posturing, gesticulating toward the fire, and in slow, measured chorus, all the Indians intoned in pathetic measure, Himalaya, Himalaya, looking first at the mound of fire and then out upon the fading sunset. It was all indescribably strange. Monarch pines standing in solemn ranks far back into the dusky heart of the forest, glowing and brightening with pulsating reflections of firelight, the ring of Indians crouching, standing fixed like graven images, or swaying mechanically to and fro, 
each tattered scarlet and white rag of their utterly squalid garments, every expression of barbaric grief or dull stolidity, were brought strongly out by the red flaming fire. Buck watched with wet eyes that slow consuming fire burn to ashes the body of his wife of many years, the mother of his group of poor frightened children. Not a stoical savage, but a despairing husband stood before us. I felt him to be human. The body at last sank into a bed of flames, which shot up higher than ever with fountains of sparks and sucked together, hiding the remains forever from view. At this, Buck sprang to the front and threw himself at the fire, but the two old women seized each a hand and dragged him back to his children, where he fell into a fit of stupor. As we walked home, Jerry was quick to ask, Didn't I tell you Injuns has feelings inside em? I answered promptly that I was convinced. And long after, as I lay awake through many night hours, listening to that shrill death wail, I felt as if any policy toward the Indians, based upon the assumption of their being brutes or devils, was nothing short of a blot on this Christian century. My sleep was light, and sunrise found me dressed, still listening, as under a kind of spell to the mourners, who, though evidently exhausted, at brief intervals uttered the cry. Alone and filled with serious reflections, I strolled over to the rancheria, finding everyone there up and about his morning duties. The tar heads, withdrawn some distance into the forest, sat leaning against a stump, chatting and grinning together, and now and then screeching by turns. I asked Revenue Stamp, a good-natured middle-aged Indian, where Buck was. He pointed to his hut and replied with an affable smile. He whiskey drunk. And who, I inquired, is that fat girl with him? Last night, he take her, new wife, was the answer. I could hardly believe, but it was the actual truth, and I went back to camp an enlightened but disillusioned man. I left that day and never had an opportunity to free my mind to Jerry. Since then, I guardedly avoid all discussion of the Indian question. When interrogated, I dodge or protest innocence, when pressed, I have been known to turn the subject, or if driven to the wall, I usually confess my opinion that the Quakers will have to work a great reformation in the Indian before he is really fit to be exterminated. The mill people and Indians told us of a wonderful group of big trees, Sequoia, Gigantea, and about one particular tree of unequaled size. We found them easily after a ride of a few miles in a northerly direction from our camp, upon a wide, flat-top spur, where they grew, as is their habit elsewhere, in company with several other coniferous species, all grouped socially together, heightening each other's beauty by contrast of form and color. In a rather open glade, where the ground was for the most part green with herbage, and conspicuously starred with upland flowers, stood the largest shaft we observed. A fire had formerly burned off a small segment of its base, not enough, however, to injure the symmetrical appearance. It was a slowly tapering, regularly round column of about 40 feet in diameter at the base and rising 274 feet adorned with a few huge branches which start horizontally from the trunk, but quickly turn down and spray out. The bark, thick but not rough, is scored up and down at considerable intervals with deep, smooth grooves, and is of the brightest cinnamon color, mottled in purple and yellow. That which impresses one most, after its vast bulk and grand, pillar-like stateliness, is the thin and inconspicuous foliage which feathers out delicately on the boughs like a mere mist of pale apple green. It would seem nothing 
when compared with the immense volume of tree for which it must do the ordinary respirative duty, but doubtless the bark performs a large share of this, its papery lamination and porous structure fitting it eminently for that purpose. Near this king of the mountains grew three other trees, one a sugar pine, Pinus lambertiana, of about eight feet in diameter, and hardly less than three hundred feet high, although we did not measure it, estimating simply by comparison of its rise above the sequoia, whose height was quite accurately determined. For a hundred and fifty feet, the pine was branchless, and as round as if turned, delicate bluish-purple in hue, and marked with a network of scorings. The branches, in nearly level poise, grew long and slenderly out from the shaft, well covered with dark yellow-green needles. The two remaining trees were firs, Picea grandis, which sprung from a common root, dividing slightly as they rose, a mass of feathery branches whose load of polished blue-green foliage, for the most part, hid the dark wood-brown trunk. Grace, exquisite spire-like taper boughs, whose plumes of green float lightly upon the air, elasticity and symmetry are its characteristics. In all directions this family continue grouping themselves always with attractive originality, there is something memorable in the harmonious yet positive colors of this sort of forest. First, the foliage and trunk of each separate tree contrast finely. Cinnamon and golden apple green in the sequoia, dark purple and yellowish green for the pine, deep wood color and bluish green of fir. The sky, which at this elevation of 6,000 feet is deep pure blue and often cloudless, is seen through the tracery of boughs and treetops, which cast downward fine and filmy shadows across the glowing trunks. Altogether, it is a wonderful setting for the sequoia. The two firs, judging by many of equal size, whose age I have studied, were about 300 years old. The pine, still hale and vigorous, not less than five hundred, and for the king of the mountains, we cannot assign a probable age of less than two thousand years. No imperishableness of mountain peak, or of fragment of human work, broken pillar, or sand-worn image half lifted over pathetic desert, none of these link the past and today with anything like the power of these monuments of living antiquity, trees that began to grow before the Christian era and, full of hale vitality and green old age, still bid fair to grow broad and high for centuries to come. Who shall predict the limits of this unexampled life? There is nothing which indicates suffering or degeneracy in the sequoia as a species, I find pathological hints that several other far younger species in the same forest are gradually giving up their struggle for existence. That singular species, Pinus sabiniana, appears to me to suffer death pains from foothill extremes of temperature and dryness, and notably from ravenous parasites of the mistletoe type. At the other extreme, the Pinus flexilis, has about half given up the fight against cold and storms. Its young are dwarfed or huddled in thickets, which such mode of growth that they may never make trees of full stature, while higher up, standing among bare rocks and fields of ice, far above all living trees, are the stark white skeletons of noble dead specimens, their blanched forms rigid and defiant, preserved from decay by a marvelous hardness of fiber and only wasted by the cutting of storm-driven crystals of snow. Still the sequoia maintains perfect health. It is, then, the vast respiring power, the atmosphere, the bland, regular climate, which gives such long life, 
and not any richness or abundance of food received from the soil. If one loves to gather the material for traveler's stories, he may find here and there a hollow fallen trunk through whose heart he may ride for many feet without bowing the head. But if he love the tree for its own grand nature, he may lie in silence upon the soft forest floor, in shadow or sunny warmth if he please, and spend many days in wonder, gazing upon majestic shafts, following their gold and purple flutings from broad, firmly planted base, up and on through the few huge branches and among the pale clouds of filmy green traced in open network upon the deep blue of the sky. Groups of this ancient race grow along the middle heights of the Sierra for almost 200 miles, marking a line of groves through the forest of lesser trees, still retaining their power of reproduction, ripening cones with regularity whose seed germinates, springs up, and grows with apparently as great vital power as the descendants of young conifers. Nor are these their only remarkable characteristics. They possess hardly any roots at all. Several in each grove have been blown down and lie slowly decomposing. They are found usually to have rested upon the ground with a few short pedestal-like feet penetrating the earth for a little way. Too soon for my pleasure, the time came when we must turn our backs upon these stately groves and push up toward the snow. Our route lay eastward between the Kings and Kawea rivers, rising as we marched, the vegetation as well as the barometer accurately measuring the change. We reached our camp on the Big Meadow Plateau on the 22nd of June, and that night the thermometer fell to 20 degrees above zero. This cold was followed by a chilly, overcast morning, and about 10 o'clock an old-fashioned snowstorm set in. Wind howled fiercely through the trees, coming down from the mountains in terribly powerful gusts. The green, flower-covered meadow was soon buried under snow, and we explorers, who had no tent, hid ourselves under piles of brush and on the lee side of hospitable stones. Our scant supply of blankets was a poor defense against such inclemency, so we crawled out and made a huge campfire around which we sat for the rest of the day. During the afternoon we were visited. A couple of hunters, with their rifles over their shoulders, seeing the smoke of our campfire, followed it through the woods and joined our circle. They were typical mountaineers, outcast from society, discontented with the world, comforting themselves in the solitude of nature by the occasional excitement of a bear fight. One was a half-breed Cherokee, rather over six feet high, powerfully built, and picturesquely dressed in buckskin breeches and green jacket. A sort of Trovatore hat completed his costume and gave him an animated appearance. The other was unmistakably a Pike Countian, who had dangled into a pair of butternut jeans. His greasy flannel shirt was pinned together with thorns in lieu of buttons, and his hat fastened back in the same way, having lost its stiffness by continual wetting. The Cherokee had a long, manly stride, and the pike a rickety sort of shuffle. His anatomy was bad, his physical condition worse, and I think he added to that a sort of pride in his own awkwardness. Seeming to have a principle of suspension somewhere about his shoulders, which maintained his head at about the right elevation above the ground, he kept up a good rate in walking without apparently making an effort. His body swayed with peculiar corkscrew motion, and his long Mississippi rifle waved to and fro through the air. We all noticed the utter contrast between them as these two men approached our fire. The hunter's taciturnity is a well-known role, but they had evidently lived so long an isolated life that they were too glad of any company 
to play it unfailingly. So it was they who opened the conversation. We found that they were now camped only a half mile from us, were hunting for deer skins, and had already accumulated a very large number. They offered us plenty of venison and were greatly interested in our proposed journeys into the high mountains. From them we learned that they had themselves penetrated farther than any others, and had only given up the exploration after wandering fruitlessly among the canyons for a month. They told us that not even Indians had crossed the Sierras to the east, and that if we did succeed in reaching this summit, we would certainly be the first. We learned from them also that a mile to the northward was a great herd of cattle in charge of a party of Mexicans. Fleeing before the continued drought at the plains, all the cattlemen of California drove the remains of their starved herds either to the coast or to the high Sierras, and grazed upon the summer pastures, descending in the autumn and living upon the dry foothill grasses until, under the influence of winter rains, the plains again clothed themselves with pasturage. The following morning, having received a present of two deer from the hunters, we packed our animals and started eastward, passing, after a few minutes' ride, the encampment of the Spaniards. About 4,000 cattle roamed over the plateau and were only looked after once or twice a week. The four Spaniards divided their time between drinking coffee and playing cards. They were engaged in the latter amusement when we passed them, and although we halted and tried to get some information, they only answered us in monosyllables and continued their game. To the eastward the plateau rose toward the high mountains in immense granite steps. We rode pleasantly through the forest over these level tables and climbed with difficulty the rugged, rock-strewn fronts, each successive step bringing us nearer the mountains and giving us a far-reaching view. Here and there the granite rose through the forest in broad, smooth domes, and many times we were obliged to climb these rocky slopes at the peril of our animals' lives. After several days of marching and countermarching, we gave up the attempt to push farther in a southeast direction and turned north toward the great canyon of King's River, which we hoped might lead us up to the snow group. Reaching the brink of this gorge, we observed about halfway down the slope, and standing at equal levels on both flanks, singular embankments, shelves a thousand feet in width, built at a height of 1,500 feet above the valley bottom, their smooth, evenly graded summits rising higher and higher to the eastward on the canyon wall until they joined the snow. They were evidently the lateral moraines of a vast extinct glacier, and that opposite us seemed to offer an easy ride into the heart of the mountains. With great difficulty we descended the long slope through chaparral and forest, reaching at length the level, smooth glacier bottom. Here, threading its way through alternate groves and meadows, was the King's River, a stream not over thirty feet in width, but rushing with all the force of a torrent. Its icy temperature was very refreshing after our weary climb down the wall. By a series of long zigzags, we succeeded in leading our animals up the flank to the top of the north moraine, and here we found ourselves upon a forest-covered causeway, almost as smooth as a railroad embankment. Its fluted crest enclosed three separate pathways, each a hundred feet wide, divided from each other by roughly laid trains of rocks, showing it evidently to be a compound moraine. As we ascended toward the mountains, the causeway was more and more isolated from the cliff until the depression between them widened to half a mile and to at least 500 feet deep. Throughout nearly a whole day, we rode comfortably along at a gentle grade, reaching at evening the region of the snow, where among innumerable huge granite blocks, 
we threaded our way in search of a campground. The mountain amphitheater which gave rise to the King's River opened to the east a broad valley into which we at length climbed, and among scattered groves of alpine pines and on patches of meadow, rode eastward till twilight, watching the high pyramidal peak which lay directly at the head of the gorge. By sunset we had gone as far as we could take the animals, and, in full view of our goal, camped for the night. The form of the mountain at the head of our ravine was purely gothic. A thousand upspringing spires and pinnacles pierce the sky in every direction. The cliffs and mountain ridges are everywhere ornamented with countless needle-like turrets. Crowning the wall to the south of our camp were series of these jagged forms standing out against the sky like a procession of colossal statues. Whichever way we turned, we were met by some extraordinary fullness of detail. Every mass seemed to have the highest possible ornamental finish. Along the lower ranks of the walls, tall straight pines, the last of the forest, were relieved against the cliffs, and the same slender forms, although carved in granite, surmounted every ridge and peak. Through this wide zone of forest we had now passed, and from its perpetual shadow had come out among the few black groves of fir into a brilliant alpine sunshine. The light, although surprisingly lively, was of a purity and refinement quite different from the strong glare of the plains. End of chapter 2 Through the Forest